The Semplica Girl Diaries, American Consumerism, and a Generational Divide. All heavy topics, but before we can get into that, we have to learn a little about the man behind the scenes. George Saunders, born on December 2nd, 1958, is an American writer from Amarillo, Texas. He has a bachelor's degree in geophysical engineering, but then switched lanes by getting his master's in creative writing from Syracuse University in 1988. From 1997 to the present, Saunders has been a faculty member of Syracuse University, teaching a creative writing class and simultaneously continuing to publish both fiction and nonfiction works. His stories tend to revolve around consumerism and usually take on a satirical tone. On the topic of what writing is for him, Saunders comments, I think what a fiction writer does is represent different viewpoints vividly and without necessarily seeming to prefer one over the other. You put two apparently opposing truths in the air and you're just letting them hang there, knowing that the real truth is that opposition. The Semplica Girl Diaries is no exception to this philosophy. It's a dystopian world where several realities are presented and it's up to the reader to decide which one they believe is the truth. Everything is based on your perception. Now with some background on George Saunders, let's jump right into the core of the Semplica Girl Diaries. The Semplica Girl Diaries is about the father of three children who struggles financially and is faced off against a society that revolves around money. The father, who is also the narrator, is in constant competition against everyone else, especially the rich. However, because of his financial insecurity, it leads to inner tension as his daughter Lily's birthday is approaching. He must compromise on bills and maxed out credit cards to make his daughter happy by buying her birthday presents. Amid this dilemma, a stroke of luck, the narrator wins $10,000 off a scratch-off. He immediately uses this money for a lawn renovation and purchases Lily all the gifts she wants and more. The lawn renovation specifically involved a Semplica girl installation. The Semplica girls are women from developing countries with no other opportunities to make money for their families, so they essentially become garden ornaments for pay. The installation raises the family status significantly garnering praise from everyone who attended Lily's surprise party, and even extending to the father's place of work, where he now receives more respect. Everything seems to be going well, when suddenly, the Semplica girls are gone. Eva, the narrator's daughter, had released them, and the Semplica girls had run off. Now the family is again in financial trouble because they have to pay for the missing Semplica girls in addition to all their maxed out credit cards. The narrator's wife, Pam, has a rich father, aptly named Rich. Farmer Rich refuses to help out since they brought these issues upon themselves and so they must dig themselves out of the situation. The narrator then works out if he defers his credit card bills, skips his mortgage payment, heat bill, and life insurance premium, he still has nowhere near enough money to pay off the missing Semplica girls. The story concludes with the narrator unable to understand why the girls would run off in a situation like this, and reminding himself to call the company to remove the now ugly installation. Saunders chose to write the Semplica girl diaries in a style similar to stream of conscious writing. As thoughts pop into the narrator's head, he writes them down in a diary-style format. This stylistic decision impacts a story in a number of ways. The reader gains direct insight into one character's mindset while being unaware of what others think. This is a first-person point-of-view story. This provides us with one perspective directly presented to us, while others have to be extrapolated through the other character's actions and dialogue. An example of this is where Eva is on the verge of crying because she believes the Semplica Girl installation is something degrading and immoral, and comments, If we want to help them, why can't we just give them the money? The narrator then writes, thinking to himself, The Semplica Girls do not look sad. 
are in fact quietly chatting in moonlight. This is reminiscent of the previous Saunders quote where he posits that his job as a fiction writer is to set up multiple realities that are all equally valid. Moving on, the choppy syntax in some sections adds an element of stress as the reader races through the short sentences. Furthermore, it adds personality to the father through the sentence structure and word choice, making the narrator seem more like a simple person dealing with everyday situations as opposed to writing a flowery dissertation as a doctor. This effectively works in conjunction with the heavy-hitting philosophical questions the father puts forward. There is a rapid succession of the questions, beginning with, there is so much I want to do and experience and give to kids. Time going by so quickly. Kids growing up so fast. If not now, when? Followed up by, if kids raise too cautious due to paucity, will not world chew them up and spit out? And finishing with, someday, I'm sure, dreams will come true. But when? Why not now? Why not? Considering these questions from the narrator, we can look more closely at the values of his generation and those of his children. Let's start off with the narrator's generation. There is a massive divide in terms of wealth. The narrator is struggling to get by with a car that is literally falling apart, while at the same time he is attending a birthday party where the family has plasma TVs, a pinball machine, a foot massager, 30 acres, 6 garages that house Ferraris, Porsches, and a historical merry-go-round, 9 horses, 6 llamas, a star observatory, a Victorian style treehouse, etc, etc. This makes the narrator feel like an inept father who cannot provide the same for his own family. Ranting, do not really like rich people, as they make us poor people feel dopey and inadequate. It is important to take into account at this point that the rich family appears to be much happier than the narrator and his family. The first suggestion about the correlation between happiness and money. Despite his limitations, it is abundantly clear that the narrator cares about his children. He takes Eva's feelings into account when he finds her sad in her room and is willing to do his absolute best to get Lily her favorite presents for her birthday. This last bit is likely satire, however. The father is showing his love through money, notably through his expensive gifts and the Sampaka girl installation. He opts to buy these decadent presents, instead of doing the responsible thing like paying off his bills and maxed out credit cards. Furthermore, as he is deciding what present to initially purchase, he takes into consideration the price, and that if he buys a second most expensive one instead of the most expensive, demonstrating cheapness, that it will elicit a negative reaction from Lily. He believes that the amount of money spent will directly contribute to how happy Lily is. Clearly, money plays a large role in our narrator's generation, and as a result, one's societal status is directly proportional to the amount of wealth accrued. Earlier I mentioned that as soon as the lawn renovation is completed and the Sampaka girls were installed, the narrator gained a newfound respect from his co-workers and it was more likely that he would begin to climb through his job's rankings. Again, money is happiness, as the narrator writes a note to himself that says, try to extend positive feelings associated with scratch-off win into all areas of life. Make point of noticing beauty of the world? Become true citizen of natural world? He ponders all these things only when he came into some money, things he could have easily done before. He becomes blinded by the money, and then fails to see the exploitation of the Sampaka girls, and even justifies it. Sampaka girls equal social status, and if everyone else has them, they can't be that bad, right? Eva challenges this, saying, so, just because everyone is doing it, that makes it right? Eva sees the problem with the Sampaka girls, but her father does not. He justifies it by saying, Sampaka girls have lived very different lives from us. Their lives, brutal, harsh, unpromising. What looks scary slash unpleasant to us may not be so scary slash unpleasant to them, i.e. they have seen worse. This is again, satire, parroting arguments that justify exploiting people. In our world, you would hear this supporting the poor working 
jobs that require excruciating labor. But they are still making money. It is either hard labor, prostitution, or starving to death. These workers trade in their humanity for money. Here Saunders leaves the reader with the question, should the workers be dehumanized to make ends meet or potentially face a worse fate? These are the realities that are both true and it's up to the individual to decide which is right. This whole situation is analogous to the Nike sweatshop scandal that happened in the 90s. When workers asked for additional rights, Nike would switch to another country to keep production costs low. This ensures that the consumer has an easier time purchasing their goods. You want to pay several times more for the same pair of sneakers produced in a humane environment? Hopefully, most would say yes. But that's simply not true. If everyone could live communally, wanting nothing more than the basic necessities, then Plato's Republic could have become the world we live in. Except, people don't just want to scrape by. We want easily accessible luxuries. Your phone, gone. Laptop, gone. No more $1 burgers from McDonald's. The system we live in demands the exploitation of people, and unless there are massive overhauls to societal morals, nothing will change. We create a dependence on American consumerism because the workers in developing countries get paid to work in inhumane conditions. There are likely no other jobs available, so as I said earlier, either sell your body or starve. The same happens in the Semplica Girl Diaries. People buy these installations, which in turn financially supports people in developing countries. However, they are literally garden ornaments, objects to be bought by the wealthy to demonstrate their status. It takes this extreme example of exploitation to bring to light what happens every day in our world. The narrator's generation perpetuates a dependence on consumerism through buying these installations and so do we by purchasing cheap electronics, clues, clothes, food, etc. Do we sacrifice our own comfortable lifestyles to ease the suffering or let it continue but enjoy the luxuries we have? That is what Saunders wanted the reader to mull over. Now comes Eva's generation. Money does not rule over her generation, and they seek equality and happiness, evidenced by Eva freeing the Semplica girls. She wanted the Semplica girls to be free because she saw what was happening to them and thought it was inhumane. However, she did not consider the ramifications of releasing them. All these unexpected costs come up that completely blindsided both of her parents. They could potentially lose their house over this. This could be a reflection of the younger generation of today wanting to stop all exploitation or naively thinking that there would be no ramifications. Those people would no longer suffer, which is good, but obviously prices of everyday things will skyrocket. Eva meant to do good, but there's a downside to that that everyone must consider. There is no obvious solution to the dilemma presented through the Semplica Girl Diaries, which is why it remains a problem today. And Saunders draws attention to it through his contemporary story on consumerism and how it affects both the rich and the poor.